We are in the middle of chapter 10. ten. Very good. We started discussing one of three personae who were introduced in chapter 1. They weren't explained, but in chapter 1 we brought up the idea, the Talmudic concept, that there are actually five subdivisions of personae. There is two types of tzaddik, two types of rasha, and a benini. So that makes five, right? Yeah. Three categories, tzaddik, rasha, benini, but there's tzaddik A, tzaddik B, rasha A, rasha B. So that gets us five subcategories. Anyways, <clears throat> in chapter 10, we started to discuss which one of the three categories? Tzaddik, Rosh Hashanah, Benini. Tzaddik. 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 Tzaddik always comes first. Yeah, maybe, that, maybe that's it. Tzaddik comes first. Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. And we discussed the two types or subcategories of Tzaddik. Tzaddik, Gomor, and Tzaddik, She'ena Gomor. Otherwise known also as Tzaddik V'toivlei would be like the Tzaddik Gomer. And Tzaddik V'raloi would be like the Tzaddik She'ena Gomer. Yeah, very good. Gomer literally means complete. And we discussed what is complete about the complete Tzaddik. Just to refresh your memory. Does the incomplete Tzaddik experience... Even on a subconscious level, temptations or distractions from the Yetzirah? Yes. 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 No. 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 Right. Neither of them experience any degree of temptation. Okay, this was, this was the basic... Yes, neutralized. Neutralized means it is as if it was not there. Completely canceled out. Completely canceled out. It's non-existent, like the rat droppings in your hot dogs. Remember? You weren't here last week? I said everybody eats a certain amount of rat droppings that the USDA deems to be negligible. I don't know, one, one part per billion or whatever it is. So you don't know about it, it doesn't affect you. It's not, it's not unhealthy, it's not unkosher. It's so minimal, it's just not going to affect you on any level. Soon they're going to say it's healthy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what? Please go ahead, yeah. What? I don't, I don't want to talk about individual people. I, I, We're describing here a concept. I'm not going to figure out who's in this category or who's not. The concept is that there's something called a tzaddik who has no yetzahara. I mean, this is what we spoke about at length last week, right? Oh, you weren't here last week? That's a good excuse. We explained at length last week. A tzaddik has no yetzahara. He has no yetzahara. So then what's the difference between the two levels of tzaddik? He has no yetzahara and he really has no yetzahara. Like what? So what's the difference? So the tzaddik gomor, not only he has no yetzahara, but actually he's disgusted by worldly temptations, physical pleasure for its own sake, mindless pleasure. That's disgusting to him. And conversely, because we said the flip side of the coin of disgust is delight, he reaches levels of delight in Hashem that the incomplete tzaddik doesn't reach. So, the incomplete tzaddik, is he tempted by what we call Ra, and I'm going to redefine 
Ra, again, as we defined it in chapter 6 of Tanya. Ra doesn't have to be diabolical evil. Ra just means selfishness. Just selfishness. Animal, soul, survival, impulse kind of stuff. Does the tzaddik, the incomplete tzaddik, have that stuff? No. No, he doesn't. No. But because there's some tiny microscopic trace amount of it that makes it effectively non-existent. However, on a subtle level, he will be lacking in the intensity of his capacity to delight in Hashem. Whereas the complete tzaddik experiences a blissful relationship with Hashem. Yes. If those worldly pleasures are uplifted, will the tzaddik... Yeah, you know what you remind me of. It's a good question. Somebody asked Reb Ali Melech. He was... Uh, he, I, I think he was like his colleague, his peer. Maybe they grew up together. And he said... Reb Ali Melech was one of the Talmidi Amagid. He was uh, a big tzaddik. I thought maybe Melech No, no. Well, okay. It's okay. Reb Ali Melech Melechensk. So somebody asked him, uh, what's the difference between me and you? You know, we both come from the same uh, background. We both, you know, learn in the same uh, yeshivas. So Rabbi Elimelech said, you know the difference? You're from a Yid. So you make a bracha in order, in order to eat an apple. I eat an apple in order to make a bracha. So, you're, you're, <laughs> exactly. So, you're asking, what if the tzaddik uplifts the worldly pleasure? What I'm telling you is the tzaddik's only interest in that worldly pleasure would be if it were to be elevated. So, we, we reverse engineer it. Right? We want to go to the baseball game and then we figure out how, right, how actually I need it from my Avedis Hashem, right? By the way, it's not, it's for the kids. It's for the kids. It's always about the kids. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's not that the tzaddik is not, the tzaddik is not engaging in pleasurable things, it's just that he does. So here's what you're asking very good. You're saying, it's not that the tzaddik gummer isn't engaging in pleasurable things. I'll tell you something. The ascetic, somebody who shuns worldly pleasure because he doesn't want to get sucked into it, right? That's a person who is actually tempted by it, so he separates himself from it. The tzaddik is not interested in that. So even the tzaddik gummer is not interested in that stuff. So, do they experience the pleasure? Like, if they if you put chocolate on their tongue, will they taste it? Yeah. See, I don't know because. First of all, remember I told you last week this tzaddik <laughs> stuff is for reference purposes. So I'm not sure how practical our knowledge is of this stuff. But I can tell you things like, you know, the Alter Rebbe, for instance. There's a famous story that, um, famous story in Chabad circles at least. The Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, the author of this sefer that we're studying. There was... Um, there was once uh, a Shabbos meal where all the women wanted to have the schus to prepare the meal. And um, so they all took different parts, but then I, I guess everyone thought it was their job to salt the soup. <laughs> so they served the soup and nobody could eat it. And the Alter Rebbe was eating it and then he noticed that no one's eating the soup. So the Alter Rebbe said, what's wrong? Does the soup need salt? So he didn't know that it was oversalted, because apparently, on his level, that kind of stuff just didn't register. Just didn't register. Okay. Salty soup, not salty soup. Like good for his blood pressure. It was. It just. So you're asking a question: Does the tzaddik know that it's pleasurable? Can, is he capable of, of feeling the pleasure? I don't know. That story seems like 
At least there's a type of a tzaddik that doesn't even feel it. But just remember, in case you're feeling sorry for the tzaddik, oh, he doesn't know what it's like to have a nice geschmack matzo ball soup. Remember what the whole definition of the tzaddik gomer, the whole definition of the tzaddik gomer is his capacity for pleasure. He's just, his pleasure is coming from his relationship with Hashem. So he's, yeah, he's not deprived in any way, shape, or form. We're, we're, we're deprived. Okay. So that's where we left off last week. Okay. Now, we are, we're about to start, yeah, in the middle of the chapter, Vehine, Madrega Zu, Vehine, you see, Madrega Zu, Vehine, Madrega Zu, this level. Eleven lines up from the bottom. This level. Meaning, the tzaddik she'enoi gomor, the incomplete tzaddik, mishalakis l'riva vois madregis is subdivided into a myriad of degrees, tens of thousands of degrees. Be'inyin bechinas miotora hanisher, as far as how much remnant of evil is left behind, from any one of the four elemental, remember we spoke about in chapter one at the end, air and uh, uh, fire, air, water and earth. And how they, uh, the humors, how they represent themselves, the elements, how they represent themselves in the human psyche. So there could be a tzaddik she'ena gamer who has a tiny little smidgen of ra from one of those four elements. But remember, whatever amount it is, it is, for all practical purposes, non-existent. But the myriad of medregas, of levels of tzaddik she'ena gamer, all depend on, oh, this guy has one billionth of a smidgen of Ra. Oh, this guy has one trillionth of a smidgen of Ra. So those are the different levels of incomplete tzaddik. 0.00001%, whatever it is. Okay. Do they round? I'm not sure what digit they round off at. No. Ube inyan bitule bimiute. Regarding, I mean, these levels are all regarding the degree of nullification. So again, it's it. They they all have one thing in common. Their their amount of ra is bottle. Which means, like we said before, it's a trace amount that has no practical bearing. But if you want to, if you want to categorize these uh, incomplete tzaddikim, they're categorized based on this, um, on this uh, criterion. Bishishim al derech mashal, whether the ra is bottle nullified one in sixty, which is most kashras items are uh, nullified. You know, like the tip of uh, the tipa tipas uh, cholov that falls in the kederes basar, the drop of milk. This is still going, right? Yeah, the screen just went out. The drop of milk that falls in the uh, the pot of uh, of meat. So that's one in sixty. Ay alef. Or maybe it's bottle one in a thousand, Uravava, or one in ten thousand, Alderch Mashal. All of these, allegorically speaking, these are just, um, he's saying there are different, different percentages, 
different degrees. Okay. And who are these different incomplete tzaddik? Vehein heim bechinois tzaddikim harabn shabacholadeiris. These are the many tzaddikim throughout the generations. In other words, if you hear about tzaddikim, generally speaking, most of them are on some level of tzaddik she'enai gamor. In case you were wondering what's more common, tzaddik gamor, tzaddik she'enai gamor. No, tzaddik she'enai gamor is much more common. Within tzaddikim, they are the the common ones. Now, even tzaddikim are rare, because remember we learned in the end of Perek Aleph that when Hashem sort of planned out history, yeah, that, very good, Shoslan, he planted them. He sort of... Uh, like sprinkled them. Sprinkled, I like that. That's a, that's a good word. Like sprinkled them across the, the timeline of history because uh, there are so few tzaddikim. But within tzaddikim themselves, who are few, um, the tzaddikim gamurim, the complete tzaddikim, are the few of the few. And most tzaddikim are the not complete variety. Like it's brought in Gemara, de temnasar alfe tzadike kai mekamea kodesh baruchu. There are 18,000 tzadikim standing before the Holy One. Ach, however, al mailas tzadik gamur, if you want to know who is this complete tzadik, who Sha'amr Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai? The Tzadik Gamer is the one referred to in the words of Rashbi. Ra'isi ben Aliyah, I have seen, we'll translate it, the men of ascent. Ben Aliyah, Aliyah is an ascent or an elevation. I've seen the men of elevation or the men of ascent. The Haim Mu'atim Chulu. They are few. The few, the proud, the tzaddikim gemorim. There are very few of them. Of names? Why does it, why was that, why is everyone hung up on names? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We don't know. We don't have names here. Okay. Now, we basically have three names for the same concept. In other words, we have two kinds of tzaddik, and one kind of tzaddik has two names, and the other kind of tzaddik has three names. And there's still so few of all five? Yeah. Yeah. So one kind of tzaddik is tzaddik she'enoi gomor, who's also known as tzaddik veraloi. Then the other type of tzaddik is tzaddik gomor, also known as tzaddik v'toyvloi. And the third name now that we've just learned is ben aliyah. Hmm? That's synonymous with the tzaddik gomor. This is a third term. Yeah. So, Tzadik Gomer, Tzadik V'tayvlai, or Ben Aliyah. We said the, the man of ascent, man yeah. of elevation. Yeah. yeah. Now, we're going to get into what that really means. I mean, that's just a translation. That's just a translation. Yeah? When you say Tzadik V'tayvlai, does it mean he doesn't suffer at all? We're not... Okay, so you're, you're asking very good. You're saying, does he not suffer at all? So... The Gemara that's referenced in chapter 1, Tzadik V'raloi, Tzadik V'tayvloi, there are different ways of understanding the terminology over there. One of them is, it's a discussion between Meshur Rabbeinu and Hashem, actually, that happened when Meshur Rabbeinu was on Har Sinai. So one of the ways of understanding the conversation is that we're talking about Ra Loi, bad things happen to him. Why do bad things happen to good people, right? Like the famous book. Um, but another interpretation is ra loy means he has ra to him. 
he has an aspect of selfishness still in his system. So he's a tzaddik, meaning that Ra has no practical bearing in his life, but on microscopic trace levels, it's still present. And therefore, where can it be seen? The indirect results, at least, are that it diminishes his capacity to delight in Hashem, which the tzaddik v'toivloi, the tzaddik to whom there is only good, doesn't mean here, like you're asking, you know, Ra loy, does bad thing, do bad things happen to him? Toiv loy, do good things happen? We're, we're using those terms differently. We're using those terms differently here. Yeah? Does it say anything about whether it's tzaddik has to be married, single, or anything like that? Married or single? No, it doesn't say. doesn't say. That's, but that, that's very impressive in a dating profile, by the way. <laughs> tzaddik gummer. We were looking for my daughter, and there's a guy who said, Tzadik Shayna Gummer. I told my wife. Maybe we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Tzadik Shayna Gummer. Hmm? Yeah. It was a Tzadik Shayna Gummer. There's 18,000 of those. We're like, we can come back. We'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So. <laughs> You like that one. Okay. We should put that in the profile. Yeah. So let's, let's find out, though, a little bit. So we translated B'nai Aliyah. Men of ascent, men of elevation. What does that mean? It's just a translation. But what is it really talking about? So let, let's find out what it's really talking about. Okay. So, Shalochain uh, Nikroim B'nai Aliyah. Now, this is the reason why they are called B'nai Aliyah. Shemahapkin hora umaylim eiseiligdusha. You know why they're called B'nai Aliyah? Well, I'll tell you a reason. And we're gonna, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to um, telegraph this to you ahead. We're going to have two different reasons why they're called B'nai Aliyah. So the, this is the first one. They're called B'nai Aliyah because they convert Ra into... Kedusha. They take that which is selfish, that which seemingly exists for its own sake, and they turn it into something devoted to the service of Hashem. They're very good at making that transformation. So they're called B'nai Aliyah. Because they elevate the mundane into the sacred. In manners that I'm sure you're familiar with in our discussions from our discussions of chapters 7 and 8, primarily chapter 7, when we spoke about the elevation of Klippas Neuge. So these B'nai Aliyah, they're really good at that. Because uh, remember, they're not at risk of getting pulled into their own interests in the mundane. So their only motivation, like we said before, the story of Reb Elimelech, that... I eat the apple in order to make the bracha. In other words, I want to go make a bracha because I understand a bracha is hamshacha, is drawing down Hashem into the world. So I go around and I find a, an apple to use as a prop. <laughs> so that's, why, that's one reason they're called b'nei aliyah. They affect that elevation of the mundane to the sacred. Kedi'i like it's brought in the introduction to the Zohar, to the Holy Zohar. Rabbi Chia, who's one of the Tanayim, he wanted to enter the heavenly abode of Rashbi. Rashbi is Heichel. And as he was nearing... Shama Kala Nafik Va'amar. He heard a voice come out and say, Man min chayin di chashoycha mahapchon l'neheira. Who among you has transformed the darkness to light? V'taymin miridu l'miska and bitter taste to sweet? Ad lo yesun hacha v'chulu. If you haven't, meaning until you've done that, don't come here. 
This is an exclusive VIP club over here, the Hegel of the Rashbi. This is only for those who have transformed darkness to light and bitter to sweet. What does that mean? They transformed darkness to light and bitter to sweet. It means they take stuff that looks detached from Hashem. It looks like it's a creation as, as opposed to creator. And they show how, no, this thing really is an expression of the will of the creator. They take the mundane object, and they sanctify it by devoting it to the performance of a mitzvah. Yeah? So it could be like Rabbi Akiva going to the Kevin's kids from Oshan and saying thank you because that was, this is the last mitzvah Oshan. Right, but, but let's, let's keep it like much more simple, like tzedakah. Let, let, let's keep it very simple, tzedakah. For a tzaddik gummer, the purpose of money is tzedakah. His, because remember, he has no self-interest, and there's nothing attractive to him about having more money. Oh, maybe I can buy some more creature comforts. That doesn't speak to him. So his whole relationship with the mundane is in order to sanctify it, to use it as a mitzvah, to do something holy with it. So why are there maximum limits of tzedakah? Why are there maximum limits of tzedakah? 20%. Okay. So without getting into a whole side conversation, the simple answer is so that the people giving tzedakah don't turn themselves into recipients of tzedakah. That's the simple answer. We don't want you to go so crazy with the tzedakah that now we have to give you tzedakah. But the complicated answer, which is still part of my short answer, that I'm being deliberately short so that we don't have to get derailed, uh, is that if you want to do the mitzvah of tzedakah, it's a, the maximum is a fifth. But then there's beyond the mitzvah of tzedakah, there's tzedakah for the purification of your soul. And for that, there's no limit. As much purification as you need. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe when we finish And that purification this, is only monetary, or it could be other things, too? Um, cash is the best. Yeah. 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 It's like birthday gifts, you know, like the thought is nice, but ultimately, you know, just send me the cash and I'll, I'll, I'll figure out the thought part on my own. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's one reason why the Tzaddik Gomer is called uh, a Ben Aliyah, is because his whole relationship with the physical world is for the sake of elevating it and turning it from mundane to, to holy. Okay. V'oid nikroim b'nei Aliyah. But there's another reason why they're called B'nai Aliyah. I told you, how many reasons are we going to have? How many do we have already? Okay, so this is it. This is the second one. If you don't like what we have out front, I'll show you what we have in the back. Right? Like every Jewish salesman. Well, if you don't like what we have out front, maybe I could interest you in something in the back. All right, let me tell you what I have in the back. So another reason they're called Bnei Aliyah. Mipnei shegam aveidosam bebechines vasei toiv bekiyam atayda mitzvei seho that when they do good by keeping toiv and mitzvahs, why do they do it? What is their motivation? Why do they put on tefillin? Why do they daven? We think to get closer to the Abishter, so then I'll one up you and say, why do they get closer to the Abishter? Who let Gavaya? It is for the 
need of the Most High. Avedel Tzedek Gavaya, by the way, is a concept that the Shalah speaks about at length. Service for the sake of the Most High. Meaning, who are you doing this for? Are you doing it for you, or are you doing it for Hashem? So, even to say, well, I'm doing it for spiritual reasons. I know spiritual reasons, but your spiritual reasons or Hashem's spiritual reasons? In other words, are you getting a spiritual high off of this? Hey, that's a lot more refined and lofty than getting a high off of other things. For sure, no doubt about it. Somebody who gets a spiritual high, that's very refined. But on a subtle level, it is self-serving. On a subtle level, it is self-serving. So what we're saying is, when they do mitzvahs and when they learn Torah, when they get close to Hashem, they don't do it because they like it, which is pretty impressive because remember what we learned about them, that they have this incredible pleasure in their connection to Hashem. And yet, see, I'm not impressed with the first definition of B'nai Aliyah because this, to say that the Tzadik Gummer only seeks out the apple in order to make a bracha, yeah, he doesn't like apples. <laughs> so, I'm, But this is more impressive to me because he serves Hashem for Hashem's benefit, not for his own benefit. That impresses me because I know that a Tzadik Gummer enjoys connecting to Hashem so much. With me, I'm more impressed when I do the first one, not the second one. For me to seek out something physical only for the sake of Hashem, that's a big deal because I have the capacity to seek out physical things for my own sake. You're doing this just for God's benefit. Just for God's benefit, right. So it's called L'Tzayrech mm-hmm. Gavaya. Yeah. Can you be born a Tzadik Ben Aliyah or do you have to ascend to so we, the, we, 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 who, who asked that last week? Who asked this last week? Yeah, and what was the answer last week? Yeah, they're born in this, this category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can be born in as an ascension? Mm-hmm. You don't have to physically ascend and you don't have to take on mitzvahs like a bar mitzvah age or something? You just don't have that. I'm not sure what the question is. This, this persona is something that a person is born with. Like a person... What? Well, obviously, a person has bechir chavshus. Everyone has free choice. Even a tzaddik gummer has free choice, so they have to choose. But it's like saying, if if I choose to practice as much as Michael Jordan, I'll be able to accomplish. No, no. I mean, there's being born with certain talents and not being born with those talents. Okay. So he does it. Letzerich gavaya umayla mayla adrum hamaylois. And for the high, the higher than high, the higher than the most high. The loy, and he says it explicitly here. He does it for the sake of the most high. That's what he does it for. And what he doesn't do it for, he says it very clearly here. The loy k'day l'davka b'yisbarich bilvad. He doesn't do it just for the sake of cleaving to Hashem. This is really lofty here because doing something for the sake of cleaving to Hashem, I thought that's a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing, but we're saying the B'nai Aliyah, they don't do mitzvahs just because it gets them close to Hashem. L'raves, I like the poetry here. L'raves tzemoyen nafshom hatzmei Hashem to slake their spiritual thirst with, which thirsts for Hashem. In other words, they are spiritually sensitive. They thirst for Hashem. And not thirsting for Hashem like we learned about, remember we learned about the person who does tshuva ma'ava, that he's so steeped in sin, God forbid, he feels so cut off, so he starts feeling, at some point he starts feeling thirsty for Hashem. But we're talking about somebody who's, who's totally steeped in holiness, and it's still not enough for him, because his capacity for spirituality is so great. So he has this incredible thirst for Hashem, and yet, when he serves Hashem, it's not to satiate this thirst, which is, why, again, why I'm going to repeat. I'm impressed by the second definition of B'nai Aliyah. Because <laughs> to say the first one, that he, that he elevates the mundane, yeah, that's the only thing he would deal with the mundane for. He doesn't have 
those temptations. But the fact that he's able to connect to Hashem because of Hashem's delight, not because of his own delight, even though his own delight is so spectacular, that impresses me. Yeah, what were we going to say? Yeah, so I have a question. My yeah. Well, it is to cleave to Hashem. That's the what. It's just not the why. You understand the distinction? The what, he is cleaving to Hashem. That's what is happening. But it's not why he's doing it. He's doing it for Hashem. The why is because Hashem likes it. So what is he doing? He's cleaving to Hashem. As opposed to the why. Where you'd say to some, why are you doing that? What do you mean why? So I can cleave to Hashem. No, no, no. He says, the what? Yeah, I'm cleaving to Hashem. Why? Why? So Hashem can have me cleave to him. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's wild. It is wild, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty marvelous, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's why they're sprinkled. That's right. Right. But that's not. The, but that's not the, the pleasure of this world that we're talking about now. That was the first thing. The engaging the in in the in this world. Right. Okay. Let 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 me let me back up. The first definition of B'nai Aliyah it describes their relationship with this world. That they only get involved in worldly things in order to convert the mundane to the holy. The second definition is actually talking about the, a, a totally different aspect of life. Not their worldly affairs, but specifically their religious involvement. Why do they do mitzvahs? Why do they learn Torah? Why are they from? Right, these are two different things right now. We're to- it's dafka spiritual things. Because, listen, a tzaddik is not going to have any personal delight in physical things, even doing it for Hashem. We're talking about things that a tzaddik does have delight in, like tefillin. When a tzaddik puts on tefillin, that's more pleasurable than, than any Viennese table that we could eat at, right? That for him, that's, what's it called, the Viennese table, right? You go to the fancy... Smorg, yeah, right. Yeah. Charcuterie. Right. That's like the first kind. That's the first category. That's the first category. The second category is when the tzaddik is doing mitzvahs and he feels how pleasurable it is He's not doing it because he's getting pleasure. He's doing it because of how much pleasure it causes Hashem. That's his motivation. You know, I gave a class Thursday night, which is actually, I told, it was for married men about marriage. I and I said the women should not listen to it. I didn't listen. So you heard the warning and you, you went away. Wow. Good. You said that so they would No, no, I did not do it as reverse psychology. No, I, I, I said women should not listen for a couple of reasons. Young married men, right? Yeah, but young is a relative term. That's true. But one, one of the things I was talking to the men about was, you know, I'll say it to you guys because you learned Chapter 7 of Tanya. Remember in Chapter 7 of Tanya when it's talking about sanctifying mundane things and it was talking about, you know, eating not for the pleasure of it, and then it spoke about intimacy, no, not to do it just for the pleasure of it. Remember that Rebbe added those few words about even, you know, with his wife, in the time of her, her purity, like everything is totally 100% kosher, and if he does it for a, you know, for, for personal uh, pleasure, then it's, unfortunately, we, we know what happens there with the potential of that 
elevation is, is, is squandered. Okay, so remember that from chapter 7. Anyways, so <laughs> some of the questions <laughs> that I was getting from the guys Thursday night, they were like, oh, so you're telling us that there should be no pleasure. And I said, first of all, I don't have that power. To, I don't have the power to take that away, you know. Like, I even if I would even if I would make a proclamation, no more pleasure is not going to do anything. I said, but I said to them, understand what I'm talking about here. <laughs> There's, I didn't say exactly in these words, but I don't want to get derailed again. I always always the temptation to get derailed, but. I'll sum up, basically I, I, what I said to them in two hours, I'll tell, I'll tell you guys in, in, in 10 seconds and you'll get it. Without love gives, love gives, lust takes. So, you understand what I'm saying? So, we all understand what that means, like, love gives, lust takes. So... <laughs> Now, but hold on a second. Now, now, let's, let's talk about a tzaddik in their intimate relationship with Hashem. The tzaddik actually has the ability, we, we, we can't even imagine such a thing, but a tzaddik actually has the ability to lust for Hashem. And therefore, I mean, this is a very high-level problem. <laughs> this is what we call gesunte <laughs> problemen. But the tzaddik could actually seek out mitzvahs as a lustful type thing. I mean, it would be pretty cool. That's your level of, that's where your lusts are. But I'm saying a tzaddik could seek out mitzvahs as personal payoff, as pleasure. So what we say, they're called b'nei, tzaddik, the tzaddik gomer, tzaddik gomer, tzaddik v'tevle, they're called b'nei aliyah because when they do engage in that very pleasurable act, they're not doing it because of the pleasure they receive. They're doing it for the pleasure that they give. Yeah? Right. Can we aspire? Chapter 14, get back to me. Yeah, chapter 14, remember your question, make a note. Let's let's see. Okay. Question was, can we aspire to some of this stuff? So I said, look at the, get back to me, chapter fourteen. Okay. Let's try to finish this chapter. Okay. Kamesha Kosov, like it says, Hoy kol mayim. All who are thirsty come to the water. Meaning he doesn't do that, even though. The tzaddik does appreciate how thirst-quenching it is to do a mitzvah, to learn Torah. But that's not his motivation. Of course it's pleasurable, but that's not why he does it. Commission is bar b'makim acher, like it is explained elsewhere. Ella, ki depir like it's explained in tekune zaya. Ezeu, chassid, who is a chassid, I love this. I love this definition of chassid. Hamis chassid im koinai. Im kandile. One who is kind to his maker, with a little play on words, koinai, maker, is read as kan, a, a nest or a place of nurture. So who is a chassid? Generally translated as a pious person, but literally Maloshin Chesed, a kind person, one who is kind to Hashem. Like, come on, you, you ever heard of being nice to God? Everyone's so busy being so reverent, so religious, stop a second. It's a relationship. Be kind. Be kind. You think Hashem is your ATM? And now I'm not speaking about people who want a 10 speed bike from Hashem. Or do you want your brand new American girl doll with the debutante ball dress? I'm just trying to give you something you guys can relate to. It's a women's class, I figure. What? The dress that the debutante. 
So yeah. the maker can also apply to your parents, but, right? What? The maker, the definition. No, no, listen, listen, listen. When I say Hashem's not an ATM, I don't just mean we're speaking to those people who want to use Hashem for material payoffs. Right now, we're speaking on an elevated level. Take it up a thousand notches. Hashem's not an ATM. We're speaking to those super sensitive tzaddikim who actually get so much pleasure from doing mitzvahs. We have to remind them, hey, is this love or is this lust? Are you giving or are you taking? Just like there's something called materialism where you covet the acquisition of material things, there could be spiritual materialism where you covet the acquisition of, of spiritual attainments. So we're warning the tzaddik, don't do it just because you like it. We're speaking, obviously, again, I'm reiterating, we're speaking on a very, very, very high level. Okay? But rather, do it because be nice to Hashem. Be kind to Hashem. Don't be a good husband because you want to be a good husband. Be nice to your wife. Or, conversely, don't be a good wife because you want to be a good wife. Be nice to your husband. So be nice to Hashem. I know you are a tzaddik and you get high off of this stuff, but that's not the point right now. Just be nice to Hashem. And watch what he calls it now. Oh, <laughs> this is similar to what you mentioned about the Baba Sali. Okay, listen. To unite the Holy One and His Shechina, His presence, down here in the physical world. In other words, what does it mean to give Hashem pleasure? What does it mean to give Hashem what He wants? Well, what's Hashem's pleasure? What does Hashem want? He wants a home down here. Why does Hashem want a home down here? We're not going to discuss this right now. We're going to discuss that at length in chapters 35, 36, 37. We're going to talk about it for three chapters. The refinement of the physical world is going to be built on a lot of concepts that we learned about already in chapter 7 when we learned about Klipas Noiga and the elevation of Klipas Noiga. We're not getting into it right now. But suffice it to say that Hashem's lust, His craving, what He's longing and pining for is a home in the physical world. So, if you're in this for his pleasure, not for your pleasure, then when you are doing those mitzvahs, which are intimate acts, you're uniting with Hashem, even though you're a tzaddik and you're getting extreme pleasure from that intimacy, but your motivation is his pleasure that he gets from the intimacy, which is the dirabatachtonim, the fact that the Holy One is being drawn down into uniting with the Shechina down here, the Shechina is down here, and holiness is, is increasing in the physical world. Okay, now, watch what happens. Watch what happens. If you are thinking half a step ahead, I think you may be sensing how we're coming full circle. Do you, you hear what I'm saying? How reason number two is going to lead us back to reason number one. That's what you were sensing. Yeah, yeah. You were, you were a little bit ahead. You were a few lines ahead. <laughs> okay. So reason number two is going to lead us back to reason number one. Because reason number one was he's called Ben Aliyah because he only engages in the physical world to elevate it, to make the mundane holy. Another reason is because when he does Spiritual stuff, he doesn't do it to quench his own thirst for his own pleasure. He does it for Hashem's pleasure. Oh, what's Hashem's pleasure? <laughs> the sanctification of the mundane takes us back to, to number one. But then it's on Hashem's terms. Not but it's on Hashem's terms. That's right. That's right. That's right. Correct. Hashem having a dwelling place down here, Hashem having a home in the physical world is synonymous with... Using mundane things... For Hashem's service is what makes this world a dwelling place for Hashem. It's not enough that Hashem made the world. Of course He made the world. But now everything in it has to be used the way He wants it to be used. And that's called making Him feel at home here. 
It's not enough that Hashem made the world. Of course he made the world. It means that everything in the world that Hashem made has to now be used the way he wants it to be used. And when we use everything in this world the way he wants it to be used, then, even as it remains in its physical state, it is elevated from mundane to sacred. And that is called Hashem having a home in this place. Okay. So watch, we have just a couple lines here. Like it says in Raya Mahamna, it's a section of the Zayar. This intent that we're describing is akin to the motivation or the emotions of the son who strives to take care of his mother and father whom he loves more than himself, than his own soul. In other words, we're comparing it to filial devotion, where a child does something selflessly for his mother and father, not because he wants it, but just to satisfy his mother and father. Selfless love. Is there such a thing? Yeah, he, yes, he's saying he's saying there's such a thing, and and he's saying this is the level called tzaddik gama. Yeah. Okay. Oh, don't get don't, guys. Don't get hung up on the marshal. I don't have an extra hour to discuss it. Okay. Okay. Umasar garme lamisa laihu. Now you guys are gonna go crazy. Umasar umasar garme lamisa laihu lamifrak loin chulo. He actually gives up his own life to redeem them. Commission is barba makemachalik. It's explained at length elsewhere. Anyways, the point is, maybe let me make it really simple. The tzaddik gomer, when he is doing mitzvahs, it's an act of marital intimacy. Okay, so it's very hard to say that he's doing it selflessly because it's a two-way street. So we kind of <laughs> to to help convey his motivation, we, we transfer that relationship to a different model. And we say, you know what? It's like pleasing your parents. Nobody enjoys that. <laughs> but you do it, you know why? Because th th that's the right thing to do. That's the right thing to do. Okay. So in other words, this is the beauty of the, the B'nai Aliyah. They take something that gives them incredible joy and pleasure and they don't do it because of the joy and pleasure, they do it because it's the right thing. So it's interesting. The things that normally give everyone else pleasure, meaning worldly stuff, that they do as, as a duty. The stuff that gives them pleasure, you know, Torah and Mitzvahs, that they do as Hashem's pleasure. Those are the two definitions of B'nai Aliyah. Okay, now, come on, yeah, Fine. Now, in the brackets, look here, in the brackets. Vishnehem oilim bekona echad. Both of these, both of what? The two reasons or definitions of B'nai Aliyah go up in a single stalk. You know where that's from? Remember Yosef at Tzaddik with the, uh, the dreams, with Pare's dreams? The stalk of uh, wheat? Yeah. So, the expression, they go up in a single stalk, means, we might say in English, they're two sides of the same coin. These two explanations for B'nai Aliyah, two sides of the same coin. He, and he spells it out. He spells it out. Ki al yedei habirurim shemevarim menoiga maili mainukvin. Because... Through, re, re, through refining the sparks of noiga, of the neutral klipa, they bring up what's called the feminine waters, which is synonymous with, uh, with the shechina. And then they draw down the masculine waters, which is like kuchabrichu, they were mentioning before, the yichud kuchabrichu. 
Shehem heim mei mei achsodim shechol mitzvah o mitzvah meramach mitzvah sase. Those are the waters of kindness that come down through every positive commandment. Shekulen heim bechines chasodim amayin chudin. They're all considered kindness and masculine waters. In other words, when they refine the physical world by using it for the sake of serving Hashem, they cause an intimate union of the feminine and masculine divine. In other words, they draw down godliness from heaven down here to earth. Like it's explained elsewhere. In other words, when they use the physical world for the sake of serving Hashem, Hashem ends up getting that which He most deeply desires, His greatest pleasure. Well, you're asking, this is for all of us, meaning, can we all do it? Yes, we all can do it. But what's unique about tzaddikim is this is the, well, and not only all tzaddikim, but tzaddikim gemodim, the, the complete tzaddikim, this is the only reason why they do it. Okay, so the mechanics being described here are not unique to a tzaddik. Anyone could do this. We can all do this. And we all, we all do do it. We all have our moments where we do something with, 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 with this motivation. And, and let me add, even when you don't have this motivation, you're still accomplishing it. What's unique about the tzaddik gomer is this is their only reason for doing it. And it's constant. Yeah, only means constant. There's no other reason why they would do anything. Yeah, for us it's, you know, sometimes you have a you know, good hair day, sometimes you have a good spiritual day, good moment. Okay, so that is the end of chapter 10. We've completed our discussion of the tzaddik. So next week, we're going to move on to another category. You'll find out what it is. Okay.